All right, gardeners, it is time. We're going to take your small garden and we're going to step it up a notch and we're going to allow you to plant more in there by going vertical. Right now, we're going to talk about vertical gardening only on the Backyard Gardens podcast. To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Welcome to the Backyard Gardens Podcast, where we talk about all things gardening. We are your hosts, Ben and Batavia, and you can find me gardening in the country. And you'll find me gardening in the city. Get ready as we dig deep into this wonderful world of gardening, where we learn to grow and grow for change. All right, everybody, real quick, before we get started, you know the deal. If you would like to support the show, Patreon links down below, two free episodes a month, extra from what you normally get. And you will be entered into our seed giveaway, which, by the way, happens the 15th of every month. So you get seed giveaways from email or being on a patron, either one. All right, everybody. Vertical gardening. Are you a fan? I'm a fan, yes. I'm not a fan, but I do it. Oh, I'm glad you said that. I meant to, to mention this to you off air, but since we're here, last week... And when we kicked off the beginning of the series, you mentioned your garden being an erector set. And I can distinctively yeah. <laughs> remember, or is it distinctly? We'll go distinctly remember um, you saying probably two years ago, like, I don't want my garden to be some damn erector set. And, yep. <laughs> and now it is. Uh huh. Uh huh. We yeah, are allowed to change a, our garden minds. It's a necessary move. You know, when you're working with a small space and you're trying to get a lot, I feel like vertical gardening is just the way to go. Let me ask you to clarify. You consider your garden a small space, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I'm bound to the size of my boxes. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my garden, I consider it small because I want to grow a lot and I don't have the room to grow what I want to grow. So that makes it small to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Is it small? I think so. I would consider my garden small as well. And um, and obviously there are levels of small, right? Like there are people that have spaces that are smaller than ours. Uh, but there is a vision that I have when it comes to someone in a large garden. Like you can barely see the last garden bed or the last garden plant or something like, yeah. you know, it's like as far as I can see, there's vegetables and things growing. Um and that's not my space, nor no, yours. No, right? not at all. No, and I mean, I don't think that, I mean, full disclosure, I don't think you need to have a large garden in order to be a gardener or a successful gardener or a productive gardener. But I think it's the techniques that we use that make us those things. Is this like the terms and conditions section of the podcast? Like, you know, on behalf of the Backyard Gardens podcast, we believe. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. And if you listen real closely, you can hear Leonard in the background doing all the fine print, like on the pharmacy commercials. <laughs> no. No, but seriously, um, you know, I remember, I don't know, this must be years ago. I went on a kick. You remember, um, and I mean, they're still popular, Upside Down Tomatoes? Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, I remember going deep down the rabbit hole. And there was a lot of people in the great state of California that were, um, you know, a lot of people have smaller yards there. And they were producing massive amounts of food by going vertical. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I mean, anything that could go vertical went vertical. Mm -hmm. And it was and it was crazy, too, because it, it wasn't just limited to trellises. It was like... You know, your upside down tomato plants and, you know, I mean, the list can go on and on. There's all kinds of different ways you can do it. Yeah. But um, it was amazing to me what they pulled out of it. But what wrung out in my mind was the varieties that they chose to grow made them get a lot of food. Mm. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's OK. <laughs> Anticlimactic, but we'll take it. So, um, yeah, I have consistently added more and more trellises to my garden. And honestly, I, I'd like to be done, but I'm probably not. You know, I'll probably add more over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. How many trellises are you running right now? Oh, dear gosh. You think I'd had, have this count in my head? One, two, three. Uh, I only have 
three like forever staying trellises. Like right. they are set up, they stay there winter, summer, spring, fall. Um, and then I do some things with like during the season, I'll put up kind of makeshift trellises, which are basically my favorites. Um, yeah. So three. Yeah, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm putting up my eighth trellis this year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and and a lot of that comes down to what I like to grow. Yeah, as well. So it doesn't, you know, my garden. I don't think there's a. I don't believe there's a blueprint for like you have to grow this in your garden in order to be, you know, a diverse garden or a good garden or anything like that. I think it's you know whatever you want to grow, and I happen to like growing trellising plants. Yeah, a vining plant. So I was thinking back. Um, I believe the only thing that I grow on a trellis now that I grew like at the beginning of my gardening were probably cucumbers. So at the very beginning, I've always grown cucumbers, but they've not always been on a trellis is my point. Um, and there are other things that I've started to grow over the years and then thought, OK, I need a better way to grow these things. Yeah. And kind of here we are. Yeah, I've never done trellis or cucumbers without a trellis. I can't say that I've done that. Uh, one of my favorite memories of my grandmother, there are a lot of them, um, telling me that I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Is, um, I've, I've shared this with you before, I think privately. She was standing on my back porch on the deck and my grandfather and I were in the yard and you know this is like you can it's a stone's throw away right you know how big the yard is and so we were planting cucumbers that I had bought cucumber plants that I had bought like you know from the home improvement store and she kept on saying you have to mound them that's not high enough that's not high enough because you know like for those plants they've been grown kind of just as trailing vines for forever and so the theory is you basically build a mound of soil and then you plant the cucumber plant at the top of that to give it some room so it's not just laying in the dirt and the reality is with two good waters that mound is coming down think about like a sand castle or something like that anywho um well are you do you have an eight foot mound (laughs) yeah right i I mean serious i don't know if but it kind of goes back to the ways of old right you know so yeah there are a lot of, I mean, food has been grown for eons without kind of the use of vertical space or vertical gardening. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I balance, try to balance, like, there are, there are some new things we're doing here, and there are some new things that really aren't necessary, some new things that we don't necessarily benefit from. You know, sometimes things are changed just for change's sake. But I'm going to tell you, neither of my grandparents live to see me grow things vertically and it's probably best that they didn't <laughs> like, and I, but I completely I think it's like one of the best things since sliced bread you know when it comes to gardening yeah and not all vining plants should be planted vertically either I mean I think that's key to remember too um, some things most things can but there are there's at least one that I can think of that you should not grow on a trellis. Mm. And I mean, it's, it's all about understanding how the plant grows and how it produces. And, you know, there's, and also there's not a perfect design for trellis or any kind of vertical system either. I mean, people use all kinds of things. I know a lot of people use teepees, Mm -hmm. like bamboo teepees. Mm -hmm. I've never done that. Yeah. I have, um, I have attempted it, and that's a part of the plan this year. There's, and I'm going to steal a little bit of the thunder because this really should be where we pick up after the break. But there is something about the gift of vertical gardening, but there's also curses. It's too strong of a, a statement. There's some definite considerations that can create other trouble for you in the garden when it comes to vertical gardening, yeah. um, which may tie into kind of not all plants are created equal when it comes to vertical gardening. But um, that's probably why I don't have more uh, trellises just based on that. So yeah, I'm out, I'm out here like leaving all kinds of breadcrumbs. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, you really are. I mean, because if you think about it, like, let me just run through the list of what we're going to talk about after the break. So we're going to talk about misconceptions, designs, 
um, ways to do it, how to and not to do. We're basically going to break down vertical garden pretty heavy. And it's it's needs to be noted that in the 852,000 years that we've been doing this back before, you know, we started making fire and wheels and stuff. This podcast has been on the air. And thank you for all those who have been on the whole time. But um, we have not really talked about vertical gardening much. And I don't know why. I think it was just a slip of the mind. I know for me, it just seemed very natural. I remember my first garden. Um, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I had, a, <laughs> I had a playground in my backyard and I ripped it down and there was a sandbox there. So I was like, hey, there's already a box here. Let me just throw some dirt in it. And I started growing. And I immediately put up a trellis to grow green beans. Um, no, cucumbers. And then I was like, oh, well, let me, since I'm growing cucumbers on the trellis, let me grow these bush beans. And then I can just, you know, I can have the best of both worlds. But the bush beans never, and as you know, I've now officially, how many years has it been? 15 years later, written it off completely. It took me that long to be like, I'm done with these. But that's how I was able to kind of quote unquote cheat the system for vertical gardening mm-hmm. in that way, because there is a, there is a cost when it comes to it. I mean, let's be honest. There's a startup cost. If you're building a trellis, if you're doing an upside down, a pyramid, you know, anything like that, there's all these different materials mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you would need in order to, to use it. And it does come with a cost, but at the same time, there's reasons that I like vertical gardening and I think it is. And most of it is just to boost productivity inside of a smaller space. So if you, you know, if you put, let's say cucumbers, for example, which I have a feeling they're going to be the big talk of the town for this episode. If you just plant those on the ground, you're just going to have a mass of cucumbers on the ground, like vines and stuff, which doesn't really work out. I've seen it before and it's not a pretty sight. Not that it can't be done and not that it wasn't intended to be that way, but you know, I do. So let's do this. Let's go to the break. And then when we come back, we're going to break down all things that I mentioned beforehand. And um, we're going to we're going to crack this vertical gardening thing wide open. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the Backyard Gardens podcast. If you like what we're doing and you want to continue to support the podcast, head over to our Patreon page to sign up. You can also make a one-time donation using PayPal. Both of these links are in the description. With your support, we can continue growing and helping others in their gardens. See ya. We want you to be a part of our gardening community. DM us a picture of your garden at Backyard Gardens TV on Instagram, and we will share it with our listeners. So as soon as we went to the break, Batavia, was that a, a fungus gnat that flew by your face? You make me freaking sick. Absolutely <laughs> it was. And I said to myself... You have another one sitting on your mic right now, just so you know. Uh, it's terrible. I said to myself, I'm right at the point of the season where I start to misjudge my watering. And these are house plants. And I thought I had done a pretty good job. But, you know, it's just, oh, they drive me crazy. Yeah. So, um, vertical gardening. So... Why do you like the vertical garden? Like, what's your main motivation behind doing it? Um, I, I think primarily the, there are two main reasons. One is um, because of some of the things that I like to grow or I want to grow. It would take up a lot of space if I grew it. What would be the original way of just, you know, letting the vines climb around as they want. Um, and then the second reason is... Um, to be quite frank, it was aesthetic wise, right? You know, so I stumbled across a YouTube page or an Instagram page or a Pinterest or something that was like, oh, look at these lovely leaves. And I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. So those yeah. are, those were the two reasons. So I actually misspoke earlier. I'm going to be putting up my ninth trellis this year and I'll, I'll be adding two this year total. So um, I did not think about the aesthetics portion of it, but that is a big benefit. And I can tell you that when I put up, <clears throat> if you look at my garden, I have in my main new garden, I have five beds. And within those five beds, um, there are three trellises that just go straight up. I do have the cattle panels, but we won't worry about those right now. I have three trellises that go up and I put those up 
so I could uh, build a room, a garden room mm-hmm. there. So when you looked at my garden, you just saw a garden. You didn't see the woods and trees behind it as much. Mm-hmm. So it really helped to kind of define that space. And it's like you, and I mean, organization is a big part of it for me too. I, I mean, was, uh, not having a big mass of vines and stuff really helps. So this is a trigger warning. Um, I was co- responding to a comment um, from someone that looked at some video for my garden and they asked, what do you do with, you know, the squirrels and the raccoons? And I don't think I've this person's commented on my videos before. So first I was offended that they mentioned raccoons. Um, but a part of my answer was the only time that I've seen raccoons in my garden has been when I've two times if it, they've only been there two times. That's that's what we're going with. That's the lie I'm telling myself. But anyway, is when I left like a platter of tomatoes that I had picked from the garden on the deck, forgot about them. The second time was towards the close of the season. And I had uh, pulled out my tomato plants and some of them still had tomatoes on the vine or whatever. And I had just dumped them in the middle of the backyard, planning on like putting them in recyclable bags the next day, didn't get around to it. And so that next morning, I saw a big old raccoon sniffing around that space. So my explanation to this person was I've only seen them when I've left things in the garden. Like, you know, I've, I've kind of, I've not kept it tidy. And so as we were talking about cucumbers and vines and with cucumber vines, you're going to have cucumbers that would be on the ground if you weren't growing them up as well. You know, I'm thinking it's a way to invite creatures to your space. That's a yeah. huge question that I get. Like, how do you avoid the animals? You know, and so people believe when you grow food, there are animals. And generally speaking, yeah, they are. You know, let's not pretend. Um, but I'm Having just, a tidy garden does help with all of that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it does, a, a tidy garden does include, if you're growing certain plants, trellises. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I had um, a, a, a young lady that I dated back in the Dizay. She had a garden and, um, <clears throat> you know, at that time in our lives, we had no business having gardens. <laughs> and she planted um, tomatoes. With no, nothing around them. And I remember even then, I wasn't really into gardening at the time. Um, but I, you know, I grew up with my grandfather gardening and I knew like second nature, you, you stake them or you cage them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. End of story. You, you don't grow a tomato without that. That's just asinine behavior. And I know somebody out there is like, well, I do it and it works fine. You know, when I respect that. But I remember going out there and she's like, go get a tomato. And I'm like, okay. And there was just this like pile of like tomato plants, like all piled yeah. up on each other that had overgrown and taken over everything else. Not to mention, I remember that it didn't get a lot of sunlight back there. So they were leggy as mm-hmm, it was. Mm-hmm. And it's like you couldn't get anything. And I remember when we finally pulled it apart, there was so many rotten tomatoes on the ground. It was just a total waste of space. Yeah. You know what I mean? And a waste of time, money, effort and all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But... If I took, let's just break down one one of my trellises is eight feet long, and along that I'll plant probably uh, this year I'll probably put I'm gonna put black eyed peas on it, and I'll probably do um I'd say ten plants roughly. So if I put those ten plants on that, then it takes up less than a square foot. You know, each mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. I mean, you know, each one takes we'll say half a square foot so I can pack more into my garden, which is really important because if I didn't, that, that those 10 plants would eat up the whole bed. Yeah. And because so the vines will go up and then over. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that is 10 square feet of, of dirt that you're using versus right. that entire bed, for instance. Right. Yeah. Um, 48 square feet. Yeah. 32 square feet. Oh, good grief. Yeah. (laughs) You know, once I get past a certain number, I'm not not doing the math in my head. Um, And I I think that that's important when you can kind of, I wasn't crazy about the idea of like, this is solely focused on small gardening. And I know you didn't necessarily say that directly, but it is a great tool for small gardeners. And I think about, you know, going back to my grandmother and, you know, make sure you do it this way. There was a lot of space that they had to farm on that even when there was a community garden space that I remember um, that's near like my childhood home, it was still a lot of space that each gardener had. So you had the 
liberty to be able to say let the plant do the thing that it does right Mm -hmm. Um, which is actually interesting because the plant doesn't doesn't necessarily want to grow up it just wants to grow right so some vegetables there is a little bit of training to get them to climb if you will um but all of that said when it comes to health of a plant when it comes to harvest when it comes to tidiness when it comes to the look and feel of it like there's only one thing i can think of at this moment in this episode that's a problem with vertical gardening and i keep on tiptoeing around it but you'll you'll get us there when we're ready to go there um yeah so (laughs) let's let's talk about the (laughs) benefits real quick um do you want to start with benefits or do you want to talk about designs like different types of vertical gardening. Let's talk about the different types of vertical gardening because just generally okay. the name is you're growing up, right? And yeah, so we've obviously mentioned trellises, right? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, what other method do you can you think of? Um, so I I tried the tomato upside down tomato. Yeah, I've seen them okay. in buckets before. I didn't have great success with it, but I think it's to what you said, the the variety. Um, I think that um, pots and kind of hanging pots, I'd consider that vertical gardening. I have some that kind of grow and tower down. So it's just the opposite. Sure. Um, and that's something that is kind of oftentimes, um, how should I say, overlooked, right? Yeah. Um, I definitely think your TP or anything that um, kind of your sticks, whether it's actual uh, tree limbs, whether it's bamboo, whether it's the plastic green ones that we see in a lot of the the shopping centers, that kind of freestanding can be formed as a trellis. We most commonly see it online as a TP. Um, let's see. I don't know. What else do you have? Did I go through all of them? Well, I mean... You have the upside down, you have the teepees, you have the trellises, you have, um, I mean, we've already talked about staking and caging tomatoes, Mm -hmm. like that's growing vertical, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people are already going vertical and don't realize it when you look at it that way. Yeah. Um, And then if you go on just moving, let's stay there for a second, staking, you stake peppers, a lot of people do, I know I do. I wouldn't Um, consider pepper plants growing vertically though. No, but if you let them and they have the peppers on them, they're going to fall over and then it's going to take up more space. So in the long run, it is considered a vertical garden, I would say, but whatever. We can, um, well, you know what? We'll default to Batavia's choice and say it is not. So my bad. Um, They have those big towers that -hmm. you can get. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Those are very popular. I'm not a huge fan of those. But they are, you know, they're there. There's a lot of startup cost on that. Yeah, I want. But if you had a very small space, I think it would be good. I want to love those, and I, I'm really interested in trying one of those. Um, I the reason why I have so many. I want milk- to love one that's free. That's yeah, what I want to love. Um, the reason why I have so many milk crates um, around my garden is because I was collecting them some years back because I was going to do a strawberry tower. Remember and that was like mm-hmm. the thing. And so I ended up just using a, a raised bed to plant my strawberries in. And now my strawberries are a thing of the past, but that's another story. Um, but that's absolutely, you know, kind of the stackable element, um, is absolutely vertical gardening. Um, well, hold on, hold on. Why are your strawberries a thing of the past? Wrong episode. I don't, I don't they know. Didn't, blame, blame. They the, didn't take over the bed. Blame the gardener. I just, I've had the uh, worst luck with strawberries these last few years. Um, it went from a seven by four foot bed that I had them planted in. Then I moved them to a four by four foot bed. And, you know, just over these last, this is like, these are four year old. This has been the fourth year. Um, they've just died back. There wasn't as much spreading as you normally see with strawberries, the plants. Okay. So um, that wasn't your issue was that they were taking over. No, no, they weren't. Yeah, no, that wasn't my Because usually that is an issue with strawberries. And so the tower would help rectify that. So that's another kind of, you know, thing. Um, and then you have the companion planting aspect, which I'm not going to get too far into. Okay. But, you know, you have the whole three sisters planting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it's plants the... Plants climb on top of plants, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not a fan of that. I think it's the most ridiculous thing. I know it was done back in the day, and it was basically a rudimentary form of trellising. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, I know there's a lot of people that practice that, so I don't want to like poo poo on them completely. But I know that the way like beans grow, it would be a nightmare 
if they got out of hand and got on your corn and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like, because what I noticed early in my journey with building trellises and stuff is you got to build them strong, man. You got to build them strong because those plants weigh. And so, I mean, I'm putting metal for them to climb on mm-hmm. and sometimes a metal bows. So imagine what it's doing to these other plants. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that you kind of want to look out for and be careful about. But, um, the, the hanging pot one too was one that was really popular when I was watching stuff. And this is like 2014, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I was really starting to, maybe it's even earlier than that. I was really looking at, no, it was 2011 and I was really getting into it. And, um, people were using window boxes mm-hmm. and they were just letting things drape naturally. And I mean, that just saves so much space. Yep. I, um, lucked up and found some. So the trouble is if you don't go to the store, you don't find the deals, right? You know, and if you go to the store, you're more inclined to be able uh, to spend money. So I was out shopping at some point, and anytime I go to any of your big box stores, grocery stores, and all, I always go to the garden center or that section. And so I found these huge um, window seal type, you know, kind of the, they sit on the banister. We're talking about the same thing, right? When they sit on like yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, and all I could think of, you know, and it's such a shame because years ago I've been like, oh, the flowers I can put in here. And I'm thinking like, oh, I could actually get some good root systems in here. Um, but that's so great because, again, if there's enough soil, I grew some lettuce, which isn't it isn't a, a plant that needs like vertical support. But I threw, grew lettuce last fall and it's just so convenient for you to, to pick to harvest, you know, um, yeah. which is actually do we get to benefits yet? No, we were just talking about the ways that you garden vertically. Yeah. Well, let's go to benefits. You're Look, everyone listening, he's going to give me a talking to. He doesn't normally do this, but he's going to give me a talking to because I'm pushing him through this episode. There's so much I want to talk about. You are pushing me. You're you're pushing me hard, but that's okay. No, you go ahead. Why don't you lead us off and let's talk about benefits. Well, I want you to give you this wheel back. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, everybody. I love you guys. Um, No, seriously, the benefits, there's, I mean, I think we've talked about them briefly, you know, the, um, the space saving is obvious, Mm -hmm. but um, there's also, you know, like I said, the organization, the designing and all that stuff. And I I don't want to let the design aspect go to sleep. I want to definitely talk about that for a minute Mm -hmm. because there is a way to incorporate these things. And if you look at something like the cattle panel trellis, the almighty cattle panel mm-hmm. trellis, imagine, I mean, that just adds so much to a garden. Yeah. But no. if you can design even vertical, regular ones in a certain way, you can, like I said, I did, you can block off parts of your garden and create rooms mm-hmm. inside mm-hmm. of it for you to go into. So um, it's just, a, it's another visual element. I mean, just because we have a garden doesn't mean it has to be like, you know, look like crap. So we should try and, you know, people grow ivies and, and flowers and mm-hmm. stuff like that mm-hmm. too, for a reason. So and they all climb. There's something to be said about a trellis that really kind of helps you track. Um, it's like a timeline of sorts, like to see a bare mm-hmm. trellis. And then to see like when a trellis fills out, you know, uh, it's it's one of the joys that I've had um, when it comes to this, these last few years when I've had like your true trellises. Um, and I definitely think that you well, you know, you already know how I feel about like the aesthetic of gardening um, also should be. Uh, also is important. I won't say that it should be like, it's your thing. You do what you want to do in your space. Um, yeah. But I do believe that if you're happy in the space you're in, you're going to be in that space more often. You're going to care for that space more often. And so, you know, if a pretty trellis isn't the thing that makes you happy, that's fine. Find something else in that garden space that makes you happy. Um, But I definitely do think I'm going to take design on a different way. Be considerate of the design before you just, you know, erect a trellis. Right. Yeah. And so I, I think that, it's one of the things that's a, it was a little bit harder than I thought when it came to like not um, necessarily realizing like how much space, how much of a room, how much shade is the thing I've been hinting at that a trellis can create. Um, so, yeah, that was we're going to get to that, too. Mm-hmm. Don't you're not going to push past this. So. That's OK. Well, at some point, <laughs> you know, 25 minutes in, I just had to say it instead of leaving folks. Hanging. I know. Yeah. 
I know it's a teaser, mm-hmm. but I mean, and then you look at other things too. Um, so one of the major, major, major benefits for me is the ease of harvesting. So this is where our first delve into varieties make a difference. So last year was the first year that I actively grew purple green bean, or for lack of a better term, purple green beans, <laughs> but you know, purple beans. Mm-hmm. And um, I did that intentionally because it would make the actual bean stick out from the foliage and then I could see it better and harvest it better. And that made a difference. But then on top of that, I don't have to be crouched over picking these things because as you know, a bean plant, for instance, can have, you can be out there and pick 50, 60 off of one plant Mm -hmm. in one day if you're lucky. So, and I would say average would be 10, 10 or 15 beans so if you have 10 plants, I mean, that's a lot of bending over and picking and lifting up these vines and going through them. So to be able to stand there and just pick them, I'm doing it with my hands, just in case y'all <laughs> wanted to know, pick, I look like I'm milking a cow, but, um, you know, that kind of, it, it really makes a huge difference to me. I think that, I don't know, it's just, you know... I kind of feel like it was the 70s when in the U.S. it became, and I could be wrong about that time frame, it became popular to start like your home movies and stuff. Like sometimes I do re- wish that I had more documented from my garden, um, like through video, through pictures. And then I just think like maybe I'm just getting more forgetful as time goes on. Like I, I'm more dependent on, you know, looking back and seeing a video. Anyway, um, yeah. I believe this to be true. I believe that I stumbled upon, oh, it's so much easier to harvest when I grow vertically. I don't yeah. know that that was my intention initially. And then I think I also stumbled upon, oh, when you grow something that isn't green, <laughs> that makes it even easier. Um, and yeah. It's a huge, huge, huge benefit, I believe, because I believe it helps tackle, um, you know, we're trying to combat waste, right? You know, and not being able to see a thing, especially when some of these things can become overripe. You know, we talk about beans, we talk about cucumbers, you talk about tomatoes. Some people do grow tomatoes on trellises, right? Um, Not being able to see that thing easily absolutely leads to it staying on the plant longer than it probably should, you know? So huge, huge. I mean, it makes, it makes a big difference. And I think, you know, once you get past the harvesting, you, you have to look a little deeper into some of the benefits, but one of them is just like disease pressure, you know? And I mean, I, I don't even want to talk about diseases right now because I can just, I can feel them creeping up on me for the summer season. But, you know, like um, in my area, tomatoes, we get um, leaf spot on them every year. And if, if you don't have that airflow, then you are not going to have a successful garden. You're going to have disease. And I remember last spring I went, I was doing like Instagram reels or something and I was being pretty successful with them. And then I started talking about airflow in my garden and it fell on deaf ears, dude. <laughs> like nobody wanted to hear it, but it's so important because that little bit of air getting through there is going to cut down on your disease pressure dramatically. And it's, it's super important. So, and it's across the board with anything that grows. But if you think about these vines and I'm going to do an estimation that a bean vine will get about 10 feet. I think that's a fair number. What do you think? Yeah, it's a fair number. Yeah. I was yeah, I counting about the feet, feet of my trellis and how far it, it climbs. But yep. Right. So you have that piled on the ground and then you water it. That's never going to dry. You know, you're going to have powdery mildew. You're going to have different funguses and you're going to be treating stuff that you didn't even know you had to treat. Well, it's going to dry, but I get I get your extremeness in that. You know, I was just thinking about... Um, and I don't know, we'll talk about this piece offline, but um, it like 
I'm always interested in the ways of old and why we're having problems we are having today. And so for this and vertical gardening is especially helpful for those that are trying to garden organically or as organically as possible. And so I'm thinking like, oh, well, think about all of those vines just traipsing around. And you and I both know that maybe not as much for the home gardener, but there were a lot of remedies just as a standard routine, you know, um, insecticides, pesticides, and all of that that have been sprayed on people's gardens that basically get to that problem before it exists. It kind of, they are combating that problem that's created for a lack of vertical gardening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so when you look at someone like you or I who try to limit what we spray, you know, because spray could be a bad word in the garden world. I don't think that it should be, but in many circles it can be since we try to limit what we spray um there are other measures that we need to take you know to try to keep our gardens healthy and growing things vertically being able to see when leaves are starting to struggle right i think it's easier to see them when they're growing vertically versus if they're just kind of crawling around the ground sitting in dirt versus not um, I think the one thing that probably is forgotten about vertical gardening, like pruning can still be a good thing, you know, when you're growing some things vertically, which goes back to your airflow, you know, or ties into your airflow. So, I mean, it's, I don't know that airflow is kind of technical, but it isn't sexy. So maybe that's why no. I fell on deaf ears. <laughs> no, it's definitely not sexy. And I think it's just, it's, you know, it's an overlooked part of what we do until you have the issue. Yeah. And for me, in my area, it's so humid that some stuff, I mean, I've gone out there and if I just let things go wild, some stuff is wet at the end of the day and there hadn't been a drop of rain. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. just from the, you know, the dew and stuff like that. So, um, and it, like my, um, my zucchinis, man. I feel like they don't ever dry out because they get so thick. And mm-hmm. then, of course, the little bastard comes, which is the squash vine borer, if you're new to the show, and just crushes them. And then that's in the story. But up until that point, you know, the bottoms of them stay wet and stuff like that. But by growing, which, by the way, you can grow um, squashes and zucchinis vertically as well. I've so grown butternut squash little... one year, and that year I grew it vertically. I have seen people grow zucchini uh, vertically. Um, yeah. But with a lot of pruning is the word that I took out of your mouth when I interrupted. Yeah. And going on with, you know, um, diseases, it can also help just by giving it space, help with um, pests. Mm-hmm. So it's not like a, it's not like, hey, if I grow vertically, like I'm not going to have pests. But what you're doing is you're taking a plant that would normally bunch up and you're opening it up. And so the pest won't jump back and forth as easy and come to find out for me, I've noticed this on my trellises and stuff. I've seen a lot of predatory insects on my trellises and they usually start there. I don't know why that is. I found it very interesting, Mm -hmm. but usually when I see them, they start there and then they kind of spread throughout the garden. They could already be in the rest of the garden. I don't know. Hmm. I think they're coming from my marigolds because they're like the number one companion plant. So there's that. The opposite of that, though, I you know, I, I don't have anything that's scientific around it. But when I look at my trellis and the things that are growing and those things that create flowers, um, the pollinators seem to like to be able to bounce around from flower to fr- flower yeah. easily. Which I yeah, think it's again, very easy for them to. Yeah. And I think it helps, too, because it displays those flowers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So they can find them easier and then that brings them into your garden more. So I do, I do agree with that. And this is a stretch, but I'm going to own it. Um, I feel like there's a bit, so this is the unconscious learning that we do, right? So just learning through observation and being able to see the form of a flower to the form of like the very beginning of the, the vegetable, um, and kind of watching that thing grow, being able to have a lot of things that, not all, but a lot of things that are at eyesight, you know, it's, um, it helps me track things like, oh, okay, I think I have two more days on, you know, our favorite cucumber, but no, that thing is actually grown to size, the size I want to harvest it at after one more day. Again, it lets me yeah. pay a bit more attention to my garden, um, which I think is just, it's, that makes you a better gardener. 
Well, it allows you to be more, it allows your garden to be more productive because you can track the growth and harvest things at the right time mm-hmm. to keep everything producing. Yep. So I agree with that completely because I will do the same thing. I'll walk in and be like, all right, there's that cucumber. And then the next day I'll be like, all right, there it is. And then the next day I'm like, all right, it's time, you know, but mm-hmm. if I walk away or if my, this is going to dovetail directly into the next part, if it's too thick on my trellis, then I miss it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then we get into the downfalls of growing vertically. Mm-hmm. So there are downfalls. Um, and that's one of them is if you don't space out, it's easy because you think, hey, this is going to grow straight up. No big deal. I'll plant them two inches apart. Boom, 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 boom. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, you've got this huge mass. And that's something that I've personally been working on is spacing out a little bit more. So like peas, for instance, they say you can plant every four inches. I've been planting them this year every eight inches Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because every year what happens is they go up and then they branch off. Yeah. And then like last year, my trellis was like, it was like straining. So, um, and I ended up getting powdery mildew Mm -hmm. and it was just so thick in there that I couldn't see anything. So that's one issue that I think would be very common and easy to, um, um, one mistake that would be very easy to do because you don't think about that. Yeah. And it's still so little space. Like you said, it's 10 square feet. So it's not like you're sacrificing yeah. that much by planting it less densely. Um, I I reserve the right to forget every year how many vines a particular plant's going to have on it. You know, how far that those vines are going to spread as it grows yeah. vertically and up the trellis. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the benefits that we said, I think personally can be reversed and talked about directly into the same issues. You know what I mean? If you're doing these techniques, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to overcrowding, like diseases Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and pests and stuff like that. Like just because they're up and they're spread out doesn't mean that you need to you need to still worry about your spacing continue with your pruning which what i do is i prune about a foot up once they get tall Mm -hmm. i prune all the leaves about a foot up and it makes a world of difference for me yeah because it keeps that that water i don't know that i do that back up i think that's a really good idea i'm just processing the um you know kind of the trouble or the downsides and i don't think it's one for one meaning if you were to grow this plant in a traditional way and not vertically, you wouldn't have this problem. It's not that for some of these, it's more of, you know, there's no matter how you grow it, a problem can be introduced. And this is an example of a problem that is introduced when you grow this thing vertically. Um, So I don't think it's, you know, all right, don't worry about growing it vertically. You'll avoid this. No, it's going to show itself in some other way. Um, I do. I think there's definitely something from leaf, to fruit whatever that vegetable is or whatever have you ratio that you you learn when you first start vertically gardening (laughs) Um, and you continue to learn right Um, and i think the easiest way is to start off with things spaced a bit more liberally Um, but that's not the easiest thing for me to do and i'm sure that's the case for some others no, it's it's hard to get yeah, spacing is, I think, the hardest one of the hardest things to do in a garden um, to do it appropriately. And I think we all struggle with it to an extent. Mm-hmm. I'm sure somebody out there doesn't. But I, I mean, I know all these years I have. And last year I tested out my black eyed peas. So I, I planted them half as much as I should on that eight foot trellis. And I got a pound of peas off of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, if I go to like I was or just a little lighter, technically I would double it. So it's not, I'm not going to complain about that at all. Um, Now I will say if you're growing something that doesn't naturally climb, but is vining. So it doesn't naturally have the tendrils that grab and twist and pull itself up, Mm -hmm. which is always a key of that should be growing vertically. If you ever see tendrils, you should honestly think about growing vertically, but those have to be trained to go up. Mm-hmm. Everything that doesn't have the tendrils and stuff, so your tomatoes, um, zucchini, squashes, winter squashes, melons, all that stuff. Um, the one thing I was referring to earlier in the episode that I don't think should be grown on a trellis is sweet potatoes. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because sometimes when the vine lays on the ground, it'll actually produce a sweet potato from the vine. So you could be missing out on harvestable produce i'm not convinced that in my climate it's kind of like uh, someone commented recently like oh you could um you know prune those tomatoes which is on my list again to do you know kind of getting closer to that 
single stem. I don't, don't, don't judge me. Um, but anywho, they're like, oh yeah, if you prune the suckers, you know, and you can actually, um, they could be rooted and implanted. And I'm just like, you know, not here, not where I am. By the time I get to that point, I'm too far in the year. But anywho, um, I'm not convinced that my sweet potatoes would have time to root and then produce another potato. But generally speaking, what you're saying is I agree. And it's a hard one because um, that's a crazy set of vines and they actually get in the way when you yeah. grow them the more traditional way. Yeah, I just, I give them a whole bed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't even try. And, you know, at first I'll, I'll plant stuff that's going to be gone soon because they have to grow. But once they fill in, they have it. You can have it. You know, it's not, it's not worth it to me yeah. to fight it. But, um, <clears throat> you know, training that stuff, I've, I have yet to grow any, well, no, I did grow a spaghetti squash one time on a tomato cage. And it was it was a pain in the ass because I was, I was having to train it. But this year I am I think I'm pretty certain that I'm going to grow my tomatoes on the cattle panel. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to give it a shot just because I, I want more space and I want to give that bed more rest from that. So I'm thinking that's what I'm going to do. Um, so we'll see. But I'm going to have to stay on top of yeah. really training it. And I mean, it's, and training it's not hard. It's just tucking the leaves and the stems in between up and through everything and well, get them to go. But there's some plants that grow wide, meaning like once they attach themselves to a trellis, they can just spread across the trellis. And then there's some plants that grow like more bushy, more out, you know, so I think for tomatoes, that's something to consider. Um, I have two years I've grown tomato plants basically next to the trellis with the intent of them growing straight up but you know nature does what it does and I think it depends on variety depends on the plant size depends on sun depends on a bunch of things Um, but last year I had a tomato plant that was more intrusive than any mint plant that I've ever seen like you know and I did basically nothing with it Um, and so that's the key like if you are managing that space I think it could be a great tool, um, but it I wasn't, and it ended up shadowing. That is like a three and a half foot by three and a half foot space, um, and it basically took over almost the entire space. So I, I almost lost yeah. the entire bed to it. Um, the only thing that it couldn't conquer were the marigolds, the giant mission marigolds that I grew last year. That thing was not to be uh, taken out, so... Yeah, and I mean that's that's just kind of part of it, but and that's why I think the a lot, the tomato upside downs really work well for those is because you're just growing them upside down. They're still doing what they want to do, but gravity is doing the work for you, right? Yeah, the challenge I found with that for the single year, but the challenge I can continue to see it, which actually is a great note for next week where we talk about container gardening. Um it's still it's a, a bucket it's a container right and so it's keeping the soil um watered the plant watered in that particular kind of upside down space what i've seen mm-hmm. more recently in years where it's a whole system and a whole setup they have it like on drip irrigation you know and so i definitely see all right you know problem solved <laughs> yeah um, yeah which is actually you hinted at this when it comes to um watering So in this instance, now you have a bunch of leaves that are, you know, kind of sprung up in the air. And depending on how you're watering, you may have a bunch of leaves that are getting wet over and over again. Um, So it would be the same if you were watering, probably worse if you were watering those things and if they were just growing along the ground. Um, But it's still like, don't discount that. Um, Another another challenge I found is that um, when you have more than one plant same variety, different variety, whatever have you, same vegetable, different vegetable. The leaves and the vines can sometimes get intertwined. Uh, so I talked about this last year when I was whining about cucumber plants. Um, and my cucumber, I don't remember if my cucumber plant was sick and it basically got wound up in the melon plants or vice versa. And so it made it harder for me to pull, for me, me and the gardener that I am, to pull one because everything was kind of interwoven. Um, so just, again, small notes, still absolutely worth its yeah. while. There it is. I have one more, though. All right. 
Oh, you do? Yeah. You better so I go said because it, but it's I, almost time. Oh, yeah. I said it, but I wanted to make sure that I spent a little bit of time with it. Um, this ties to design and the shading bit. So it can yes. be great to actually sit under a trellis that you've created, you know, like with the cattle panel. Sometimes we grow those from one bed to another or one space to another. And it creates this great shade once it, it uh, fills out. Um, but also consider how the sun's going to basically flow over that. So I have the third raised bed gets the least um, sun compared to the other two raised beds because it's on the other side of the trellis, you know, from where the sun rises. Yeah. Uh, and so has it created a big problem for me? Uh, no. Do I believe that uh, maybe that garden bed is less productive based on what I'm planting and how it's positioned and how much sun it gets or doesn't get. Yeah, I think it's a little bit less productive. Um, so it's uh, leaves create a lot of shade. Like you don't need an umbrella if you sit up under my trellis. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, same with mine. Uh, yeah. So definitely consider that. Well, and I mean, the thing is, so what I, what I recommend is this one First, you should know which way the sun travels throughout your space. Um, again, it's not another one of those non-sexy things, and it's not something that you can just get right away. You kind of have to observe the sun, mm -hmm. which leads me to say, two, if you're just starting your garden and you're not familiar with where the sun goes, don't get overly ambitious in installing these things. Give it some time. Um, you know, I started with one garden bed in mine and then I went to three, four, five, you know, and then I, I built up. So I knew what was going to cause what, mm -hmm. you know, I knew in my head, like, this is where the sun's going to go. This is going to be a potential issue. And I identified it and I was willing to accept it. Mm -hmm. But I added my trellises in last and the, um, and my main garden, I put in the cattle panel arches last because that's when I kind of figured out, Hey, this is the way that the sun's going to go. And it really has only left me to be able to plant on one side of the trellis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which isn't the end of the world at a time. Yeah. So I can rotate crops in and out, but if I put it on one side, it's going to shade the other side. So I need to either plant on the back first and time it and get it a big boost or just plant on one side at a time. And I've kind of landed on planting on one side at a time. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Because in the summertime, my son and I like to sit up under it in the shade. You know, it'll be high noon. And we're going to sit under there and relax. <laughs> so we'll do stuff like that. But um, yeah, shading out is a big issue. And it's just something that you're going to have to either figure out, figure out or just be willing to relocate a trellis if you have to. Yeah. But I would hate for you to do a lot of work and then like have to tear it down. That would not be very fun. Yeah, or limit yourself in planting like what you you really wanted to grow this on the trellis, but you know. So I mean, I yeah. think again, it's I've not grown the same thing in the same trellis space more than two years in a row. Like I've changed it, and I'm not. Yeah, that's how I am. Yeah, I'm not convinced that. Um, like I'm thinking about going back to like my first year of growing on some of these trellises. Like I'm going to use that design because I think that really worked. It's one of those weird things of changing something like, you know how they say if it's not broken, don't fix it. Like, I don't know that it was broken and I was trying to fix it. But again, it comes with time. Well, you know, we always tweak it. We learn, live and learn. You garden and you learn. Put it on a shirt. That's right. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. Because right now. BYG spring until June 21st. Check the link below. 25% off all shirts. Um, sorry, cheap plug. All right. So if Miss Batavia has a recipe, then we will be back with the recipe, recipe of, of the day. day. Oh, yeah. And then we're going to talk about good candidates for this real quick. So recipe of the day. This episode is proudly sponsored by The Garden We Share from North-South Books. It's an inspiring new picture book written by Zoe Tucker and illustrated by Juliana Sweeney, the number one New York Times bestselling illustrator of We Are the Gardeners by Joanna Gaines. This beautiful book celebrates the friendship between a young girl and an elderly woman as they plant seeds in a community garden alongside friends and neighbors waiting for the seeds to flower. 
A Great Gift for All Ages, on sale spring 2022 at a bookstore near you or online. Please visit northsouth.com for more information. To everything, there is a season in this beautiful book about treasured memories and gardening. Ben, what question do we get asked the most? I would have to say it's probably more something like, what are the products we use in our gardens the most? Ding, 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 ding. That's the correct answer. Hey, there's an Amazon link below. When you get over to the Amazon store, know that you're going to be supporting the podcast, but all of the products both Batavia and I have used in our gardens. We want to see you all over on YouTube, so check us out at Backyard Gardens TV to watch our podcasts and other gardening videos. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're back. So, um, Miss Batavia looked me dead in my eyes and said, "You do it." <laughs> I don't know why you're pretending so, you're surprised. The way you even introduced the recipe of the day was kind of like, I don't know, she can figure it out. Well, you've been looking. I seen you yeah, over there, man. like brainstorming. I'm, I'm tapping out. I'm tapping out. All right, everybody. Um, I'm gonna do my best, and I'm gonna tell you um, how to make vegetarian sushi. So this is what happens when you give me 30 seconds to come up with a recipe. I'm already impressed. Go on. I had okay. sushi last so, weekend. Mm-hmm. It's mostly technique, but I'm going to tell you the technique. And we might even show you on the backyard kitchen in future seasons. Um, but seriously, what you do is you cook the rice and you overfill the rice. So, you know, your usual ratio of rice. What is it? Ha- um, two to one, two to water. to to. to- cup of rice yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so you would go like two and a quarter to one and then you would overcook it basically this is how we do it um and then you're gonna let the rice completely cool just like the previous episode when we were making um fried rice so you're gonna make it uh completely cool and then i like to put rice vinegar on my fingers and work it into the rice okay then we're gonna set it aside and then you're gonna cut finely um carrots avocado cucumber and really anything else you want. I like to put a sliver of jalapeno in there just because I'm weird. Um, and then you take them and you just do long slivers cause you know, you got to fit them in there and you're going to need some seaweed paper. So we get saran wrap and you can use, um, traditionally you would use a bamboo mat. So they make sushi bamboo mats, but you can also use like a lot of people will have, um, bamboo place mats. They work just fine. So you would put saran wrap down and then you would put your rice down a thin layer of that and you would smash it down to about a quarter of an inch. Okay. Tightly packed. Then you put your paper on top of that and then you line your vegetables up on it. You just put them in there and then you're going to roll it tight. And every once in a while you're going to come back and you're going to roll it a little tight and you can put a little olive oil on your fingers to keep the rice from sticking to it. We're just going to keep rolling it tight, nice and tight. And then when you're done, you're going to take it and you're going to roll it continue to roll it like you would like you're you mean i mean go back to kindergarten like you're in play-doh making a snake you know what i'm saying you're just gonna roll that billy goat out and then you unwrap it you take it and you take a nice sharp knife and then you're gonna put it in water and um rice vinegar and that will keep the rice from sticking to the knife and you're gonna cut it just like sushi right down and you're done and you can put anything you want you can put any kind of meat anything like that um we get powdered wasabi add water put it on Bada bing, bada boom, and you've got sushi. So it's all about the technique. Mm -hmm. So just focus on that technique. Get that bamboo mat, get the rice, cool the rice, flatten it down. Don't go too thick on the rice because remember, as you roll it, you're going to get the rice will double over on itself. So you could essentially have, you know, we've made them when we first made them. They're about the size of our fist, which nobody want to eat that. So. And then there you go. You have just made a vegetarian sushi. A little bit of soy sauce if you want. A little bit of sesame oil if you want to get crazy. Um, all that good stuff. So good on you. Nice save vegetarian there. Vegetarian sushi. Yeah, <laughs> I pulled that one out. So we make it. I think we make it about four or five times a year. We don't make it a whole lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's an it's intense. It's a labor intensive yeah. thing, but it's an eye popper when you know you serve it to people. Maybe I'll have it for dinner. Nice. Anyways. <clears throat> so good candidates 
for trellising. Let's mm. break it down into easy, hard, and no good. So give us an easy one. Give me two. I'll give you two. Um, beans and melons. Melons are easy. Mm-hmm. Is there a trick behind the melons of course that you should is. give out? So, um, depending on your melon size, but generally I'd say the, um, fruit itself, the weight is not really designed to hang vertically. <laughs> it's not going to just stay suspended in the air. So I use, um, what is it called? Um, hammocking is a term yeah. where I've used old, Tool fabric, T U L L E, is what I use to cover some of my garden beds to save them from some um, some pests. And so, because that fabric isn't designed to be used for that, it's not great for wear and tear. So, once it started to tear, I save it, and then I'd use it like whatever I had last season. I'll use it this season to support my melons. So, you just take fabric, old t shirts, stockings, any of that will do, and basically cuff the melon as it starts to grow and then tie it to the trellis. Um, So that's a trick for your larger fruit. I've not had to do that with, well, I'll let you give your two because I have a comment around um, a set of vegetables that you you would think you would need to do that, but you don't need to do it for. Yeah. So I would say cucumbers and peas. I mean, those are just like give me's, but they all have the tendrils that climb and they pull themselves up. And honestly, I can't imagine another way to grow them without some kind of vertical setup. Yeah. Yeah. Cucumbers, um, I think they are right behind melons when it comes to the size of the leaves themselves. So not just the actual vines, but like the size of the leaves are huge. Um, And it's very easy for, you know, that fruit to get lost in there um yeah so i i I probably won't ever grow cucumbers any other way um and then peas depending on the variety you have some of them only grow like two feet tall and so you know you got a whole trellis space and it's only gonna get two feet tall but it still needs some support um all right those i think those four are solid okay now give us two that are not good candidates I'm not crazy about tomatoes on a trellis. You, you, I'm doing it this yeah, year. Yeah, you picked and you're up not, on that when I you mentioned it earlier. I'm not crazy about it. So I think the reason you asked the question around melons is the same reason I'm going to point to tomatoes. Um, I think with a pruning hand, it's a great use. I think without pruning, um, your tomatoes could get lost as well as it could use more space than you intend. So I can support it, but I'm going to put those asterisks. You got to be willing to kind of do that additional work. So for one, um, I don't know that I have a second one that I'd say that's bad for trellising. I still think anything that's intrusive, there's this one, I think it's moonflower. It's not a vegetable, it's a flower. So anything that's vining that... Uh, it's still kind of intrusive. Just because it's going to grow up doesn't mean it's going to be good for your space. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The trellis I put in my front yard over the weekend, you saw the yeah, picture yeah, I sent yeah. you? I'm putting jasmine on it. so It goes wild, but that's, that's all you're going to put on there, right? That's all I'm yeah. going to put on there. I, I've saved that jasmine in pots for a year now just for this project. So You're so disciplined. Um, I love that about you. <laughs> hey, look, it comes from years of growing bonsai. Mm-hmm. Like, you get used to it. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean, I think flowers in general, like vining flowers, for sure. I think those go without saying are are good. We should we we glossed over those the whole time, but they for sure need to go on to a trellis. Um, but I would say I don't like growing winter squash vertically. I don't like it. It's it's a pain in the butt, um, and it's probably going to be the only reason I, I would say that's going to be about like a tomato. But the only difference is the vine for the squash gets bigger and so it's not as pliable and easy to move yeah so there's that situation so the reason why Um, i didn't comment on it was because i thought you would say winter squash and it's not it does it didn't need to be hammocked when i grew it and i grew butternut and uh spaghetti squash and those are kind of your bigger um i mean it's not a pumpkin which i guess probably would be a bad one too (laughs) yeah yeah no i agree well yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that. No, I agree with that. I I grew a spaghetti squash one time. I didn't have to trellis or a hammock it either, 
But um, and anything that you have to hammock, I would say too. Anything with heavy fruits, like I'm not into that because that's just one extra step that I'm not really willing to deal with. I hear you. But you're gonna be pruning so, your tomatoes. Um, you got that plan? I prune anyways. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, last year I pruned the crap out of them just to try and make space. So I'm cool. You got another bad one? Um, I don't know. I think I just mentioned like two or three. So oh, okay. Did I? No, you didn't. Oh, um, dun, 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 dun. I'm going to say no. Okay. I don't. You could take my, you know, melon as a bad one. I think it's okay that we have differing opinions on that. Oh, sure. I think. Sure, melons. I think it's, um, I try to separate my success the same way when I have some loss, like it doesn't mean because it was successful for me or I consider it easy that the you know whole of the population would, right? Similar to... Hey, look, we're not here sp- spreading gospel. We're just talking about experience. <laughs> Similar to if I struggle with it, it doesn't mean that, you know, the next person won't. But I'm here to tell you, yeah. hey, this is my struggle, so be on the lookout. And the only other thing I would say is, um, I would say sweet potatoes are a no-no because you could be missing out on a couple of extra sweet potatoes, given that you've grown in enough time. So there's that. Anything that you would say don't grow on it vertically? No, I don't think I have anything that's like a, I mean, if, if it's not going to get more than a foot tall, don't bother wasting your space for vertical gardening. Uh, yeah, you know, so I do think there is the, um, you know, you're you're trying to save in space, and if you're not using that trellis space or whatever you've erected, then it's kind of been a waste. Um, so I'd love to hear someone that successfully grown. I've seen it on the web, grown zucchini vertically, so kind of straight up and staked. Um, I really want to understand, like, is it as much work as it appears to be? Um, I would say yeah. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, you've heard about vertical gardening. Now the question is: Is Batavia going to get a vegetable tower or a garden tower, or whatever you want to call it, and plant it? I think. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be a little bit of cha-ching, but let's. We could talk I a think- little bit about that during container gardening next week. Yeah, we're curious. So we're going to continue this next week with container gardening. And um, I'm personally excited about that one. So we will talk about that. But, you know, if you guys want to be a patron, check out below. We'd love to have you with us and join the community garden, help support the show and get those two extra podcasts a month. And don't forget about the t-shirts, BYG Spring, 25% off until June 20th. And until then, everybody be safe. It's just not t-shirts. There's much, much more gear there. Don't. Yeah. yeah. T-shirts, cups, mugs. Sweatshirts. Although we're getting packs. out of that weather, it's still pretty cozy. Uh, so. I'm not advertising sweatshirts in spring. I refuse. Okay. Be you. <laughs> I got two layers on today. <laughs> there you go. All right, everybody. Y'all have a good one. See ya. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Please follow us on YouTube at Backyard Gardens TV. Instagram at Backyard Gardens TV. Over on our website, BackyardGardensTV.com. And then we have Patreon at Backyard Gardens. And don't forget to check out our links below to help the show. Thank you so much for joining us as we learn to grow and grow for change. Cut. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the Backyard Gardens podcast. If you like what we're doing and you want to continue to support the podcast, head over to our Patreon page to sign up. You can also make a one-time donation using PayPal. Both of these links are in the description. With your support, we can continue growing and helping others in their gardens. See ya. If you guys want some Backyard Gardens gear, go to the link below and check out our t-shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and other gear. All purchases go towards helping to support the show, so thank you so much in advance, and we hope you enjoy. We want everybody to have a garden, and we're going to give you a chance to win free seeds every month. Head over to BackyardGardensTV.com and enter your email address to be entered in all of our giveaways. Good luck! 
We want you to be a part of our gardening community. DM us a picture of your garden at Backyard Gardens TV on Instagram, and we will share it with our listeners.